Hello everyone! In this video, I will give a basic introduction to the conception of k-space. I'm sure as a student starting to learn MRI, you must have heard about k-space many times and wondered what does it mean. I hope you will have a deeper understanding about it after this video. Now let's get started. To many students, k-space sounds mysterious and very hard to understand at the beginning. Here I will give you the first impression of k-space. Before any explanation, I will show you two images. Here is the first image. What is it? It's okay if you don't know, this image itself doesn't make any sense for anyone. Okay, let's look at the second image. I believe this is straightforward for everyone. It's an image of brain, or I can say, this is a brain image in spatial space. We all know that each pixel on this image can be described by its spatial location on x and y axis. Now, if we look, look back to the first image, let me tell you, it is actually the same brain image, but in the spatial frequency domain, and it is also called k-space. The k-space has two axes, kx and ky representing spatial frequencies along x and y directions. That's where the name of k-space comes from. Fourier's transform is a bridge connecting a spatial space and its k-space. It is an advanced mathematical operation. By taking Fourier transform, an image can be converted to its k-space. And the k-space can also be converted back to an image with inverse Fourier transform. If you are confusing about the definition of spatial frequency, don't worry, take a look at this example. Here I am showing you two images. Can you tell me which one has higher spatial frequency? Yes, I believe most people answered this question correctly. The image on the right has a higher spatial frequency than the image on the left because it changes faster spatially. Therefore, you have understood the definition of spatial frequency. It is a conception describing how fast an image changes spatially. Another question, which k is it, kx or ky? Because both images are changing along the x direction, and there is no any spatial change along y direction. So the answer is kx. In the meantime, we can say that the ky of both images equal to zero because again, there is no any spatial change along y direction. If we try to locate these two images on the k-space, they will be located approximately at these two points because ky is zero for both images. They must be on the kx axis, and the point closer to the k-space center represents the image with lower kx, while the other point which is a little far away from the k-space center represents the image with higher kx. Now, if I rotate them by 90 degrees, then the kx of both images will become zero, while the ky of the image on the right will be greater than that of the image on the left. So they will be located on kx space like this. I mentioned that Fourier transform is a bridge connecting spatial space and the spatial frequency space. And the signal can be converted back and forth between these two spaces using Fourier transform. Here is a 1D illustration for Fourier transform. The signal wave in red on the left is the square wave in spatial space. By taking Fourier transform, the signal wave is decomposed into several trigonometric components with different spatial frequencies. And then, these trigonometric components are assigned to k-space according to their spatial frequencies. That's how we get its k-space. Reversely, 
By taking inverse Fourier transform, the case-based signal will be first converted back to several trigonometric waves. Then, after summing these trigonometric waves up, the original square wave is recovered. Now we will expand it to 2D for a brain image. By taking the Fourier transform on this brain image, it will be first decomposed into many components, and each component is a striped image with a unique spatial frequency. Then, they will be placed onto the case space according to their spatial frequencies. After all components are placed correctly onto the case space, the Fourier transform is finished and we will get this case space of this brain image. Inversely, the inverse Fourier transform allows us to recover the brain image from its case space. First, the points on the case space will be converted back into many striped images with different spatial frequencies according to their case space locations. Then, by summing all these striped images up, the image will be recovered. Here is a video showing the whole, whole summing up process. As you can see, it starts from some striped patterns, and as more and the more different striped patterns coming in, we can gradually see some edges. Now, after proceeding to low spatial frequencies, this brain image looks much better. Finally, we get this brain image recovered perfectly. What I want to emphasize and remind you is that there is no one-point-to-one-point -one -point relationship between an image and its case space. For many students who are new to MRI, there is a very common misunderstanding that they think a pixel on an image can be changed by alternating a point of data on its case space. I will show you an example to prove this is wrong. Here is an image and its case space. Now, if we make a point of data on case space much brighter than it's supposed to be, the brain image will become like this. Many stripes are added onto this brain image as pointed by the arrows here, here, and here. Therefore, by changing only one point in case space, Almost the whole brain image changed. Again, there is no one-to-one -one relationship between these two. As I mentioned earlier, each point in the case space corresponds to a striped image with a unique spatial frequency. How does its location relate to a striped pattern? If we look at these two points located along the kx axis, they both represent vertical striped patterns, while the pattern corresponding to the point closer to the case space center changes slower along the x direction, which also means it has a lower spatial frequency. Then, if we look at another two points located along the ky axis, they both represent horizontal striped pattern, while again, the pattern corresponding to the point closer to the case space center has the lower spatial frequency. So the first observation is that the central parts of case space contain mostly the low frequency components of an image, while the outer case space contains the high frequency components. Another observation is that the striped patterns are always perpendicular to the line connecting a point and the case space center. The points on x-axis correspond to vertical patterns, while the points on y-axis correspond to horizontal patterns. We have two additional examples here. Although they are not on any axis, 
Its corresponding pattern is still per perpendicular to its connecting line to the k-space center. Here is another illustration for our two observations. Again, while this point in k-space is going far away from the k-space center, the image is changing faster and faster spatially. And the strength pattern is always perpendicular to the line connecting this point to the k-space center. Here is another interesting experiment to help you better understand this. Again, we have a brain image and its k-space. Then, if we zero out a small area in the central k-space, the image will magically become like this. Why? Think about it. Since we've moved the low, lower frequency components in this image and only kept the higher frequency components, which part of the image has higher spatial frequency? or you can say change faster spatially, it's the edges. That explains why there are only some edges left. In contrast, if we only keep the central case space and zero out higher frequency components, this image will become very similar as the original one. But if you compare carefully, this image is definitely smoother and more blurred. Why? Because this image has only lower frequency components left. They change it slower. Another point that I want to mention is that central case space contains much more energy and information about the image than the outer case space. In this case, even though we only kept a very small area in central case space, the image looks actually not that bad. Here is another animation showing what we have observed. While more and more central part of case space coming in, this image is gradually changing from some edges to a good looking human brain. We have talked enough about the properties of k-space. Now let's move on to feeling a k-space. In MRI, this is the process of signal acquisition. Before the k-space is filled, it is just like a array of blank grids awaiting the arrival of the data. As an analogy, I think, think of it as an empty goalboard. Because of the mechanism of MRI, the MRI signal is intrinsically in k-space. So each MRI signal data can be thought as a goal chance. The task of MRI signal acquisition is filling all the grids of this goal board with the correct chance. As long as all grids are filled correctly, it doesn't matter how you fill it. There are four common styles of filling the k-space. The first way, and also the simplest way, is filling the k-space row by row. This is called Cartesian sampling. What's more, the k-space can also be filled in a zigzag style. This is usually called EPI, or you can say this is a zigzag Cartesian sampling. In addition to Cartesian sampling, the k-space can also be filled with non-Cartesian trajectories. For example, this is a radio sampling pattern. The MRI signal data can be filled in each radio line, one by one, from the k-space center to periphery. Similar to the radio sampling, spiral sampling is another example of non-Cartesian way of filling the k-space. The designing of sampling trajectory is actually very flexible, and there are tons of different ways have been explored by MRI scientists. With the further understanding about MRI grid in its magnetic field, you may also design your own sampling trajectories. This is all about the basic knowledge about k-space that I want to share with you. Thanks for your attention. If you like this video, please follow our YouTube channel Loft Lab. Thank you. Bye bye.